Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Mike Cortez, Erwin Stewart, and Ken Hayes. Plus our new patrons, Clint and Ed. Everybody welcome Woo-hoo, Clint and Ed. 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 Welcome Ed. to the Ed, Clint, you're the best. On this episode of DTNS, a new type of RAM can make powerful laptops thinner, get better battery, and upgradable. Plus, the U.S. tightens restrictions on Huawei, and Apple targeted artists with its new iPads. Artist Scott Johnson tells us if they succeeded with him. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 8th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. It is a lovely Wednesday. It is the day after an Annapolis announcement. An Annapolis announcement? No, Annapolis. An yeah. Annapolis. Easy for uh, me to say. If you're in Annapolis sure. and watch the Apple announcement, <laughs> give yourself a high five. Please That's send us Tom's an email. Saying. Feedback <laughs> at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, let's start with the quick hits. Reuters sources say the U.S. Department of Justice is considering whether it will file charges of misleading investors about the self-driving capabilities of Teslas. It's also considering whether wire fraud was committed because of interstate communications to consumers about capabilities. Like any probe, it may not result in any charges. Microsoft has closed a number of game studios under Bethesda and made some job cuts at the company as well. Microsoft will also move Roadhouse Studios into ZeniMax Online Studios and close AlphaDog Games. Uh, There will also be a game that will no longer receive updates or new downloadable content, but will remain online to play, and that is Redfall. At Apple's iPad event on Tuesday that included a refresh line of the iPad Air and new iPad Pros, Apple didn't note that it's actually removed the ultra-wide camera from the rear camera module together on the Pro. 9to5Mac also notes that with the performance jump of the 10-core CPU found inside the new M4 chip, highly touted by Apple, only it only it that only arrives in that form on the one and two terabyte iPad Pro models, which of course are the most expensive. Lower storage iPads get an M4 chip, all the same, with a nine core CPU, 10 core GPU, and eight gigs of RAM rather than 16. People have been very upset about Reddit and all the moves it made around moderators and how it was all just related to their stock IPO. So there were a lot of eyeballs on Reddit's first earnings report since it publicly publicly issued that stock in March. And here is the bad news. Revenue is up 48% over the previous year. Ad revenue was a big driver of that, up 39%. And it reported 82.7 million daily active users beating expectations. Tom, I am so sorry for your loss. I know. I know. Yeah. So wait, wait. These actually seem like good numbers now that I'm looking at them. Yeah, weird. Oh, yeah. I should put my glasses on. No, no. These are good numbers. These are yeah. really sorry, good Sorry, everybody. No. <laughs> okay. Google DeepMind has unveiled AlphaFold 3, the newest version of the transformative machine learning model. AlphaFold first debuted back in 2018 as a model at predicting protein structure from the sequence of amino acids that make up those structures. AlphaFold 3 is a more accurate version of this and can now predict interactions with other biomolecules as a research tool. It also allows multiple molecules to be simulated at once. So a strand of DNA, some DNA DNA binding molecules, even some ions, throw those in there. Google DeepMind is offering AlphaFold Server uh, a a free, fully hosted web app, making the model available for non-commercial use. But, okay, we saved a bunch of months of research, sometimes years, with folding at all. Now we're saving weeks to months by saying what these folded molecules combined with. What about the grad assistants? Huh? What are they going to do now? Well, yeah, what's up? What's just, are you going to go party at your local <laughs> They're going to go thing? party. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. Department of Commerce confirmed to the Financial Times that it has revoked a few, or the, in their words, certain export licenses uh, for hardware that was mostly being used by Huawei. Uh, that directly affects the bottom lines of both Intel and Qualcomm, uh, both of which have been selling these semiconductors to Huawei, and Huawei has been using using them in laptops and phones. Huawei already had restrictions on buying U.S. technology. That's been in place since 2019, but it was the higher-end stuff. 
Uh, some U.S. lawmakers continue to say it conducts espionage around the world, although Huawei has repeatedly denied that it does that. As a result of the revoked licenses, Intel said in a statement Wednesday that it now expects its second quarter revenue looking forward to fall below the midpoint of its previously guided 12.5 billion to 13.5 billion range. Not saying it's going below that range, just saying it's going to be lower than the midpoint of that range, which tends to make the street not happy. Intel also said it continues to expect revenue and earnings per share to grow in 2024 from a year earlier. So Intel saying we're not, you know, we're still on the up and up, but this is going to give us a, a, a hit, so to speak. A lot of companies have and continue to benefit from a global market. So Scott, thoughts on this kind of trade war that we've been we've been seeing uh, going on between the U.S. and Huawei since uh, 2019, really, um, on a large scale, affecting a lot of other companies. Well, it was a nice reminder that um, none of this happens in a vacuum when when you know you shut down trade routes, or I guess there's a better way of saying that when you shut down trade with certain companies uh, or in certain countries and territories, you're basically saying, and that includes any kind of subcontracting you already do with you know, companies in our country. And then mm. those companies have to make a bet. They have to do a little bit of wagering on how this is going to go. So I'm sure that this didn't blindside Intel. Um, they were already kind of not doing great uh, in general as far as growth goes. But for them, I, I think they are in full awareness mode when it comes to this sort of stuff, as is everybody over there. You hear about this with different services and different web providers, and you hear about it with video game companies. They all just don't quite know what's going to happen from one side or the other. One day China might ban a whole thing, and you're like, well, that's our whole business model. What do we do now? And on, on the other hand, a European Union or U.S. Um, uh, you know, law changes, and suddenly you're, you're dealing with something else, and you lose a bunch of sales as a result. Yeah, suddenly so I, your app with 170 million users is going to be banned in a year. Yeah, right. We're just talking about that. That's a, exactly. There's a good. That's maybe the biggest, most notable example these days. But um, it's it's interesting to think though. There's a lot of trickle down aspect to this. So you know, Intel is obviously not the company uh, being targeted here, but they are providing con or uh, uh, you know chips and hardware to said company. So what do they do now? Well, hopefully they have they have a backup plan. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I th think the fact that there's a range, the 12.5 to 13.5 billion, and they're, they're now saying we're going to hit the midpoint means they factored this in. Uh, they didn't give an exact number. They gave a range because the range accounted for it's possible that these licenses to sell to China, which are mostly going to Huawei, uh, go away. And if they do then it's going to be at the bottom end of that range. And the licenses are going away. So Intel's like, yeah, guess what? Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. It's going to the bottom of that range. It's not as bad for Qualcomm as it is for Intel, simply because Intel is already in a shakier spot. They have other issues going on. If you have a robust business that's doing well, which Qualcomm basically does, uh, this isn't great, but it's not going to shake you as much as if you're it's a Intel. Headache more than which, yes, exactly, something that's exactly. Your bottom line. Whereas Intel is scrambling, and it's like, okay, here's another thing we're going to do. Um, but you know, to to give the wider picture here, if you're wondering about like, well, wait a minute, why is the U.S. hurting its own com companies? It's not doing it to hurt its own companies. It is trying to slow down China's advance with artificial intelligence. That is the big scare that the United States have: is that the that China will get ahead with large language models and other tools like it. And they're doing everything, all of this, banning TikTok, uh, restricting uh, chips. It's all meant to slow down China's progress towards AI, in my opinion. I, and a lot of people also share that opinion. Uh, and so what they're doing here is saying Huawei was starting to bounce back. Huawei was starting to make money. Huawei also is one of the companies that could advance China's interests in artificial intelligence research. Uh, we are no longer going to allow these licenses. We allowed them because we knew it would hurt hurt Intel and Qualcomm and others to to disallow them. But at this point, it looks like the U.S. has made the choice of we'd rather hurt Intel and Qualcomm a little bit in order to hurt Huawei enough that we can slow down the amount of resources they have to develop artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think that's true. And also, you know, everybody everybody in the in that supply chain is is motivated to sell things and make money. And when these kind of channels go away, my guess is it'll get filled with something else. But also, it seems like if 
uh, Huawei needs chips, they're going to find chips. Like this idea that, you know, shutting down certain manufacturers of chips is going to stop them from getting what they need seems a little crazy. To it'll me. slow them down, though. Right. It'll slow and them it'll down. It, and it'll make down. it more costly. So yeah. that's that's the idea, right? Yeah. But I don't know if it actually like how much of a slowdown is it to AI development? Ah, that's negligible to me. <laughs> Again, you're just you're just throwing. It's like throwing logs. You know, they'll yeah. drive over the logs, but it, they won't be able to go as fast. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a metaphor everyone can identify with. <laughs> yep. I mean, I drove over some logs over the weekend, you know, and it did See? slow me down. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about, uh, some, some PC parts that are positive for everybody. Micron is shipping some upgradable memory modules called LP cam two. Uh, they cost around 330 bucks and you can find them inside the new Lenovo ThinkPad P1 gen seven. Now what's exciting about these besides their catchy name, uh, they are less than half the size of upgradable dims the so dims that you use to upgrade ram right now and they have more power right now if you want power efficiency you want lpddr memory you need to solder that memory to the motherboard because of low voltage you will have signal loss if you don't do that so if you want the best power efficient memory uh you don't have upgradability LP Cam 2 sockets are near the CPU. There are some other interface designs that mean you can still get the low voltage power efficiency and use LP DDR5X, but also be upgradable. So the big advantage of LP Cam 2 is I don't have to have it soldered to my motherboard so I can have power efficient, good RAM and replace it. That means I don't have to buy all the RAM I think I'll ever need when I buy the machine. I can buy what I can afford and know I can upgrade it later. Uh, Dell developed this as a standard. Uh, Samsung and ADTA are among folks backing it. So even though we only have Lenovo and Micron uh, shipping products right now, it looks possible that this could become more widespread. Uh, and for those who know what it, what it, that it matters, it also supports a dual channel with one card, whereas mm. with SODIMS, you got to have two. Uh, so it is going to allow you to get a more powerful laptop that's thinner because it's half the size of the SODIMS, but also upgradable. Yeah, that's a big boon for for uh, in the gaming space. There's other applications, obviously, but in the gaming space, there, there's a lot of uh, sense in this because... People are looking for more portable, powerful solutions. It's not like you couldn't get a gaming laptop in the past that wasn't powerful, uh, quote unquote. But uh, a lot of times, but you it sacrifice, wouldn't be upgradable. Exactly, yeah. you sacrifice that upgradability. This is a clearer path for people to have the device longer and to have a better upgrade path. So, I'm uh, personally, I think this is is great, and it feels like um, an in well an iteration because not really it's been around for a bit. These these specs and these ideas and the open source stuff Dell did. Um, but to see it, you know, latch on is going to be a good thing, you know, for both gamers. And I think just power users in general, people that need a bunch of power on the go, uh, with less battery usage and, you know, all the other benefits to this and an upgrade path in the future. Like, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you get excited about this? Yeah. And it's just going to further the, the trend of a laptop being a form factor choice rather than a, a, a spec choice. Right. In other words, you could get the desktop or the laptop. It just depends on whether you want to carry one around or not. Uh, percentage chances, y'all think Apple ever goes to LP Cam 2 in their oh, devices. And I, I, I think the answer is, well, they make their own silicon, so forget it. They're not going to do it. But yeah, or they could, yeah. is there if it's open, if it's based on a standard, an open standard, they could quote unquote fork it and do their own thing. You know, but they're already like, designing the RAM into the chip, so yeah, that's I think true. the chances are almost zero. Yeah, I, I don't think Apple wants anything to do with this, but uh, for everybody else, unless you're like, I love my soldering iron, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are good. Um, you know, this sounds like it just you know gives you more choice off the bat, uh, makes things more portable, and yeah, if you want, you know, a rig um, uh, of of a certain spec, uh, and you never were able to have that in a smaller machine before, then this is all going in the right direction. Yeah. Now Raymond says they they can, but they'll slap a premium price on it for Apple branded LP Cam too. Uh, <laughs> not not impossible. Uh, I do though. It did make me realize like you won't see it in. Well, I mean, it's still Apple Silicon. I was like, maybe you would see it in, in an Apple Pro, Pro in a Mac yeah. Pro. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and those maybe. Uh, have we uh, the maybe. the Mac Pro shipping yet with the with silicon? I can't remember if they're shipping. Not those. yet. Okay. When they no, do, we, I'd be we very have curious. Not heard much about the Pro. Yeah, because <laughs> will thing, there even be a Mac Pro? There may not be. I've got a studio now, and that thing is making me. I'll never buy a Pro. I don't need it. This thing is so fast. So maybe they'll just focus on that. But um, the other thing I was going to say uh, from a from a sort of gamer's perspective. You know, RAM isn't always the thing we think of, though, when we think of upgrades. A lot of times we're already at kind of overkill levels of RAM. Maybe not notebooks so much, but in desktops for sure, where more upgradability would be nice would be things like GPUs and larger SSDs, which is usually possible. But uh, GPUs in, in particular on net notebooks are notoriously burned on there and you cannot replace it and or upgrade it. So I'd like to see more of this sort of thinking, but applied to those other points, yeah. those other vectors of upgrade. Well, and there's a great backstory here of Dell developing this and then saying, you know what? This should be a standard. Yeah. We, they could have gate kept it. Uh, and and they were the first to put out an LPCAM uh, module at all before LPCAM 2 mm -hmm. uh, in a desktop. But they made it a standard so that others could also put it out there. And I would assume you're going to see it in Dell laptops. You're going to see it in Samsung products. Uh, you're going to see other makers like uh, ADTA, uh, not just Micron. So, uh, yeah, I... I I think uh, I think this is going to be good for the Windows machine world. Yep. I can't wait for the benchmarks. Let's get going with it. All right. That one was one that I know folks uh, saw on our subreddit and were like talking about. What else would you like to hear us talk about on the show? Let us know at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. So yesterday with uh, Snob OS podcast, Terrence Gaines and Nika Monford, we talked at length about Apple's big iPad announcement, the good, the bad, what we were excited about, what we were scratching our heads about and everything in between. It included on the hardware side, um, and it was mostly a hardware announcement, new iPad Airs, new iPad Pros, the M4 chip, a new Apple Pencil Pro, a new Magic Keyboard. And on the software side, some nifty additions uh, to uh, Final Cut Pro, Logic Pro 2, multi-cam support, getting its own app. Now, Scott, I know as a working artist who already loves the Apple Pencil, um, mm. you have you have touted your love for the Pencil um, yeah. and also uses Apple products as creation devices. What stood out to you from Apple's announcements yesterday? Because it did seem very creator focused. Yeah, I think so too. And I actually really, I took heart in that because, you know, one of the things a lot of us who have converted to iPad Pro and Pencil and other app combinations for il digital illustration over previous methods Part of the reason we did that is because it seemed like Apple was really leaning into supporting that that kind of user. And this is, in my opinion, yesterday was great news on that front. I think this is them saying, yep, we know we got a ton of artists using this thing and maybe even more than we thought they were going to. So some of these features are specific to them and some of these improvements are very specifically improvements for those for those folks. So I saw the overall uh, thing to be pretty positive from that perspective. If you're somebody who is just like, well, I just need a tablet to browse while I'm watching TV, uh, these pros are not for you. You don't you don't need them. Um, although much more affordable iPads in the iPad lineup are in there. They uh, have uh, 2.0 pencil use cases. They're as powerful now as my current pro is. So you could do a lot of damage in the art world with just even one of those. Um, but for pro users, making them thinner... Uh, giving us a lot more color depth to work with when you're talking OLED screens. That means we're going to have more color accuracy. We're going to be able to apply color profiles, do our color separations in a way that we can eyeball more than having to test it in other ways. Um, it's not that it was bad before. The screens currently are really nice. This is a, a step forward in that regard. Um, the the A lot of people are kind of, not moaning, but talking the usual talk about how, well, it's kind of expensive and prohibitive for people to get into it. Uh, the 13-inch, for example, of the Pro starting at $1299 and the new Pencil uh, Pro starting at $129. I guess it starts and stops at $129. There's no upgrades to that. <laughs> it's right? $129. <laughs> um, but uh, there, are, there are some things you can do with the iPad. But anyway, um, it is expensive. It's about 200 bucks more than the previous uh, model was at those you know, at the higher spec uh, or at that entry spec. And 
um, you might look at it and go, well, geez, what are they trying to do? Price me out. But if you are a working digital artist and you are in this ecosystem, and by that I just mean, you know, you're using Procreate or you're using uh, various other, you know, apps on it and you're producing your work there, then this is actually really inexpensive still. Um, a solution from Wacom or any other quality digital tablet maker, you're somewhere in the range of, you know, three, four thousand dollars for those devices, for the ones you're going to want anyway. Um, that is not to say that there aren't plenty of less expensive items, including, you know, stuff in the iPad lineup for people who just don't need uh, the top end cutting edge. Now, I love my iPad Pro. I've loved it for really since the first model. And I'm getting one of these new ones. This uh, I've skipped a couple of upgrades because they were very incremental. This is a big one, in my opinion. And uh, so in a week and a half or so, I'll have uh, the iPad and the pencil, and I'll be able to talk more about it on this show. Um, to give just a couple of other notes about this, uh, you can say all the, like Tim Cook can talk all day about how great the pencil improvements are, squeeze it to get a menu, uh, haptic feedback. I thought feedback. that looked cool, at least in it the does. demo. It does yeah. look cool. There's no doubt about it. And I think I'm going to be able to use that in some context. But what people really, really want out of, iterating this pencil is lower and lower latency and it's already kind of top in class best latency in class and they're claiming even less latency now that's a big deal people really want to hear that but the other big selling point is is a thing that the pencil you need the pencil for to take advantage of i guess if you just want no glare it's good for you too but this nano texture screen that you can upgrade to when you buy the thing yeah it's an option it's an option. It does two. It, it yeah. does two things. One eliminates a ton of glare, and if you're looking at it from different angles and stuff, that's one thing. But the thing I'm caring, I'm caring the most about is it's going to replicate the feel and texture of something more akin to paper or illustration board. Uh, uh -huh. That's a big deal uh, mm -hmm. for me. Now, when I get it, it may be less uh, impressive, or maybe it'll be. And, and not for think. touch with your finger, but for the pencil, right? For the pencil is what, specifically. Is what excites you. Something that you, feels I mean. more like, not glass, but something that's, you know, it has that crunchy paper feel. Yeah, because right now you're, you're using, tactile, you're using a, a, a plastic tipped pen, uh, you know, really well made sturdy one, but you're using that against glass. And a lot of people buy these layers. You can get a, a stick on layer that is essentially does the same thing, gives a little bit of texture. Sure. And it means you just have more drag. The problem with those is you sometimes wear the nibs down faster because there's a lot more friction going on. It sounds like they've thought of that here. I don't know how much friction it's going to provide. These are all questions we're going to have to mess with it to answer. But that all, again, leads me down the path of Apple cares about artists. There's money there's money in that banana stand. <laughs> um, <laughs> they sell a lot of devices to a lot of artists, and I think they know it. And it also, that just fits with Apple's whole vibe, man. They're here supporting the artists, man. You know, like it's just a big hippie love in with that stuff. And I'm happy about it. Now, how apps, big popular apps like Procreate and uh, uh, what's it's called, Studio, or even the, the Creative Labs or the uh, Creative Cloud apps from Adobe, how these will benefit from all of this? It's hard to say. I'm sure they'll implement features. Certainly, it's more powerful, can handle more layers, like all that stuff I expect to see uh, be really cool. Um, and like I said, when I get mine, the first thing, one of the first things I'm going to do is come on here and tell you if I was right or wrong. Because this, it was interesting you know. to see Procreate included in mm -hmm. the announcement. I think it was the only third party voice we heard from in this particular one. Yeah, and it makes sense. They are so, they have become the thing they are it on that on that platform and they're they are beloved by the artists who use it they are uh, that's very image editing right procreate correct procreate is all about drawing and illustration and painting and inks and pencils and like it is an artist tool top to bottom if you're going to use photoshop great you could use it for that stuff but that's also for you know photo retouching and regular photoshop stuff this thing is for artists and everybody i know and their dog is using this thing and it's still very inexpensive. I think it's 19 bucks is all. You never pay a subscription. You just get it. Uh, mm -hmm. Works flawlessly. Everything I make is on that thing. So I'm really excited to uh, to see how this goes. And and I may eat some a little crow at the end and go, eh, it's all right. It's not that big. It's not worth $1,300 plus. You know, I don't know. But at this stage, I'm I'm actually pretty stoked about it. Well, this is exciting. Yeah. And we uh, we have a different kind of artist weighing in on the iPad in the mailbag. 
Indeed. Uh, Ryan wrote in saying, regarding the weight difference on the iPad Pro, I can say confidently that in daily use, the weight matters. We were talking about this yesterday, like, eh, was it really that, you know, heavy before? Ryan says, as a DJ who works in more production heavy private events, I'm all, all, always making sure there's backups to things. My backpack on event days has two laptops, an iPad Pro plus an assortment of small tools, adapters, accessories. Every pound that can get shaved off of device weight makes it that much easier to lug around. I have to say, says Ryan, I wasn't in the market for a faster, more powerful, lighter, etc. iPad Pro at the moment. My 12.9-inch original M1 iPad Pro is still serving my needs quite well. However, what won me over was that anti-glare design of the new screen. I find myself working outside nearly every weekend for wedding ceremonies, trying to read notes and remote control audio devices. Using an iPad on a sunny day is a challenge. I may have to pick up one of the new ones to see how much improvement there is working outdoors. There you go. Artistry. Of there you go. Types. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and then we also got an email from Andy who says, as a South African living in Australia, I was interested to hear about Amazon finally launching in South Africa. Thanks for always keeping me informed. You're welcome, Andy. Uh, regarding the lack of Amazon Prime, when Amazon launched in Australia in 2018, they were also missing a Prime offering. That only arrived about nine months later. I guess that's the expected gestation period. <laughs> to this day, Prime in Australia is is still missing many of the benefits that the USA gets. So I'd expect a slow rollout in South Africa too. While there are competing services in South Africa, none of them are of Amazon's quality. The launch of Amazon will hopefully mean those competitors will have to up their game. This very much happened in Australia. Online retail here was pretty dire before Amazon launched, but the competition has definitely delivered improvements. Oh, Andy, thank you so much for for giving us a, 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 a you know, on the ground <laughs> in two different in two different continents. Yeah, uh, right. No yeah, yeah. Two continents um, for one. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Very, very cool. Uh, thanks to everybody who sends in uh, your feedback um, and uh, helps keep us keep us learning every day. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com is where to send those emails. Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us. What would you like to tell folks where to go when uh, they don't see you here? Well, uh, this week you're going to want to tune into Core, uh, the video game podcast we do on Thursdays. If you're interested in that world at all, uh, big stuff this week. In fact, we're coming off a couple of weeks of like, Big, high-level controversy and scandal. Uh, we try to kind of avoid the scandal part, but um, this week's is, is worth talking about. You heard it in the quick quick hits. There's a big thing with Microsoft. They just laid off a ton more people and closed some studios that they swore were being really successful not that long ago. So everybody's kind of open arms. We're going to break it down for you on Thursday night. That's frogpants.com slash core or find core wherever you get your podcasts. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, I know some of you were put off by Apple crushing a bunch of stuff in the announcement yesterday. They've put that out as an ad as well to keep the message out there about how thin the new iPad Pros are. Are you upset? We'll talk about it. Just a reminder, we do this show live, and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about generative voice AI and security with none other than Shannon Morse. She knows what she's talking about, and we'll talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>